right. Well, this time around, apparently, you know, it is, you know, welcome to the Joan Woodward um, lecture series and to the whoa, event uh, tonight. And, you know, two or three things before introducing, uh, you know, th those that are going to be speaking more substantially. And, you know, this is, you know, of course, it's a very, it's an important day, an important day that we're celebrating women and the role of women in society than in business. And certainly something, an area, a focus, that's quite important for the business school. It has been part of our strategic endeavors, um, you know, since about 2014 in a very significant way, in the way that we think about the strategy of the school. That became materialized also in the fact that we, in 2016, got the Athena Swan Bronze Award, one of the first business schools to get that award. And this is an area that we've been working very hard to, you know, evolve, change, and adapt and it's hard because, you know, recruiting, you know, I can tell you, for example, this year we're, you know, hiring academics, for example, is a very particular, you know, endeavor that works in a very structured market over the year in the business school side. And I can tell you that this, uh, this year, I think we've made about probably 12 offers to female academics, right? And we've hired about, you know, three or four, but it's very hard to do. And it's something that, you know, we're very committed. It has to be a very long-term effort. That's one, one aspect. But the other aspect is that to tackle this issue, and especially as we think about the role of, you know, that we have in breaking the bias, it's not just the gender bias. There are a variety of other bias that we have to gender. And it's been very present at the university, the importance of the right culture and an, inc an inclusive culture and the role that we all have in trying to instill that culture at all levels. And that's true, you know, within the academic staff, the professional staff, with the students, and in the relationships between all these groups. And this is certainly something that is really critical for the business school. And we've, you know, we have a variety of initiatives to try to contribute to, to, uh, to change the, the, the environment and to create a more inclusive culture. And this week, we felt that it was a really good opportunity to reflect on that and to bring together not just the lecture that brings us today, but a set of initiatives throughout the week around breaking the bias and reflecting on that, you know, in different um, aspects, per certainly in terms of, you know, connecting with the academics, connecting with the boards and connecting with the students and making that community working together. And working together also in terms of the team that puts this event, that this set, set of initiatives together. And so certainly that brought together council, and today we have here John Allen, you know, the chair of council, who's going to come on stage in a little bit um, to introduce um, uh, Vivian Hunt uh, uh, involved, and also, you know, Mary Meany, um, you know, a member of our advisory board and a member of council very involved, Leila Guerra, our vice dean education, and a much broader team that has been involved in putting this, not only what we're doing tonight, but also the broader set of events through the week. And, you know, working with, you know, the program teams, the, the student community to really cr create around, along this week an opportunity for us to reflect on what we're doing right, what we need to do better, what are our priorities, what are the challenges, not just for us as a business school, but in more broadly in organizations. And that's why it's not about hearing what we do just internally, but also hearing what's happening out, out there in the business and the environment, both you know, the good examples, the challenges, and the focus. Because, you know, when we think about our role as an educational institution, it's not about just what our faculty and our academics and our staff has to offer, but also finding ways to make sure that we're connected to the broader environment, that we can bring those challenges to the learning experience that our community has. And that's why we're really delighted to, to have this lecture today and to have this, uh, the presence of so many of you that have come tonight. And so, besides thanking those that are organizing, I, of course, want to thank Vivian Hunt for coming and accepting our invitation to give the lecture tonight. You know, we're delighted. We've had opportunity to collaborate and to have your contribution in other events. And so, it's really a pleasure and an honor to have you here contributing tonight. And the, <clears throat> the last that I'll do is just to introduce Dot Griffith, who's, you know, will be speaking about the lecture tonight. And Dot is uh, a tour de force here in the college and in the business school. You know, a professor uh, of sociology 
here in the, in the business school uh, for a long time. She rose into leadership positions, and became the dean of the business school, uh, and then uh, after stepping down from, from the dean, you know, became uh, you know, a special envoy for gender equity at, at the university. And that was just because that's really what she did throughout all her career. And so when, when you got to that nomination, that was just a, a no-brainer because that's really something that you've been doing all your career. And so I'm delighted to have you here uh, presenting the, the, the lecture and contributing uh, tonight. It's always so nice to have you back here at the, uh, at the college uh, to, to contribute to our, to our initiatives. Thank you very much and thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of the session. Well, after that introduction, I'm almost speechless. <laughs> it's lovely to be back, and I'm, it's actually a great pleasure to be back this evening because I've been asked to share some memories of Joan Woodward, and she was a remarkable woman, and the lecture is named after her, and the reason I'm here tonight is, one, I'm very old, and so I remember her, uh, and also that she appointed me many, many, many years ago to Imperial College. So she started my career in this institution. And she was the first social scientist at Imperial. She was invited to come to the college by a very far-sighted engineer called Willis Jackson, who thought engineering students should understand something about the organizations in which they were going to work. So she was brought into the college to teach them about engineering organizations. And a tradition which is still carried on in the business school through the undergraduate service courses that the, the business school offers to the college. And I've always thought they were an incredibly important part of what the business school does in Imperial. But Joan, we, Joan was an industrial sociologist. We were called that then. I think you're organizational behavior now, but we were industrial sociologists in those days. And prior to Joan, people thought that organization structures and the social relationships within them were determined by their goals. So that, for example, all organizations doing similar things would look similar. All health organizations would be similar because they were health organizations. All manufacturing organizations would be similar in structures and processes and relationships because they were manufacturing organizations. And we're talking now about the 50s and 60s, a long time ago. John's great insight based on a very, very famous study at the time of 100 manufacturing organizations in Southeast Essex, an unlikely site for such a world-breaking study, but Southeast Essex, her great insight was that this was not the case and that successful organizations in manufacturing did not all have the same social structures, not, did not all have the same patterns of relationships. Rather, she found that they were a reflection of the type of technology that they used. So if you had an, automotive, an automatic, automated manufacturing process, the organization looked very different to if you were a batch production organization. Now, this might not sound very revolutionary in 2022. Indeed, it might sound rather deterministic to think of organizations as structured by their technology. But in the 1960s, this was revolutionary. And Joan Woodward was the first industrial sociologist to have that insight. Work of her work, word of her work, and I haven't had a drink yet, honestly. <laughs> word of her work reached the US, where some others were beginning to reach the same conclusions. And there was a very famous conference held in 1966 in Cape, God, Cape Cod, where Joan was invited along with six men. So they were the six men that had started to work in this area, plus Joan. Uh, and I believe that they called themselves the Magnificent Seven, but that's never been in writing, but that's what I heard at the time. Uh, and you have to understand that in the 1960s, academia was far less international than it is today. So it's very hard to underemphasize Joan's achievement. She was the only female invitee she was the only European invitee, and she was the, acknowledged as the first in the field. So this was an extraordinary achievement for a woman who'd done research in Southeast Essex uh, 
1958. But she came to the college in 58. She didn't get her chair until 1969. Draw your own conclusions. Uh, but in 1969, she did get a chair, only the second woman. She was a very popular teacher, and I can remember sitting at the back as a very young researcher in some of her lectures, watching the students transfixed by her stories from the companies that she worked with. And she taught them to think about issues from all angles. She brought shop stewards in from Fords, which at that time had very troubled industrial relations and an enormous uh, manufacturing facility in Dagenham in Essex. Something about Joan and Essex, I think. But this was very different. People weren't bringing shop stewards in to Imperial College students at that time. So it was revolutionary. One of the things she said was, you should become friends with the organization you study. Because if you become friends with them, you'll learn so much more about them. And creating this friendship was made much easier by Joan's personal warmth. She was sought after by companies for the wisdom she imparted as part of this friendship and warmth. At that time, many researchers struggled. I can remember my colleagues in other universities struggling to get companies to agree to be research sites for us. At Imperial, with Joan, we had companies coming to us saying, would you like to do some research in our organization? Because they wanted access to Joan for her insights and her, and her warmth, really. And she was a great mentor to the young team of researchers that she recruited. I remember going on fieldwork visits with her and the care she took to discuss them with us afterwards and the interest she showed in the views of her possibly rather naive young recruits. She obviously knew quite a lot more than the rest of us did. She wore her remarkable achievements lightly and was very modest about them. Like many of us, she experienced and articulated imposter syndrome. So it isn't something we've invented more recently. But notwithstanding this, she made a whole cohort of young female academics feel that it was perfectly normal to get a chair at Imperial College and be fated by scholars internationally. She was a role model before we talked about role models. Tragically, she died from breast cancer in 1971. Her funeral was a who's who of the corporate and government world. Again, remarkable for a female social scientist in 1971. The world was so different then. And her in her memory, this lecture was endowed at that time. So it's great that all these years later, we can remember the work that she did, the contributions she did, the examples she gave to us all, and indeed for me personally, uh, the examples she gave to me. It was an honor and a privilege to work with her and it's been an honour and a privilege to share these memories with you this evening. Thank you. Right. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and I've got a real privilege uh, this evening, which is to introduce our, our guest speaker. But before that, I'd just like to see how important I think this initiative is and, you know, my thanks to all those who've been involved in putting it together. You know, we are at a turning point, I think, in our and many other societies. I mean, m I spend most of my time not in Imperial College, but in chairing two public companies outside. And, you know, we, by the end of this year, are determined that 40% of our boards will be made up of, of women and we're well on track to do that. And I think what people have learned, it wasn't a kind of too much of a revelation for me, is that when you go out and look for talent in a determined way, there is an amazing amount of talent out there in every sector of our population, whether that be defined by gender or race or sexuality or whatever. You know, there are really, really talented people if you're prepared to go and look for it. And I think that's, that's changing attitudes and actually making boards work more effectively. Because one of the things I've... I've found in my career is just how effective female non-executives can be, how they're able to ask difficult and searching questions in a non-aggressive way, which most men like me struggle to do. Um, they're very much better at it. So we're making progress, but as I think you're going to hear over the course of the next few days, we've still got a huge amount to do. But anyway, tonight, you know, let me turn to our, our guest lecturer, um, Dame Vivian Hunt, 
uh, is a very, very distinguished person to, to be here. She's a senior partner for McKinsey and Company, uh, UK and Ireland. She pre previously served as managing partner for the UK for and Ireland for seven years. And she's been named in the past the most influential black woman in Britain, quote, one of the top 25 consultants in the world, and quote, one of the 30 most influential people in the city of London. You know, you pull all of those things together, and uh, you know, I remember enough about the kind of set theory I learned as a young mathematics student to recognize there aren't too many people who would, um, uh, you know, when you capture the intersection of those, those three sets. Uh, she advises corporate, public, and third sector clients on all sorts of topics. She's co-authored some of McKinsey's most influential um, uh, studies in the past, uh, often focused on diversity. Um, she is, uh, uh, I think, been responsible for a series of publications on diversity, which have, uh, I think, just let me get my notes, got stuck together, uh, starting with the power of parity in 2016, delivering through diversity in 2018, Diversity Wins, How Inclusion Matters in 2020, and most recently she's written Diversity Still Matters, um, highlighting the importance of inclusion and diversity for recovery from the crisis, current crisis that we're facing in the aftermath of, of COVID. Um, so we've got lots to do, lots of challenges ahead at the moment. You know, we have the challenges of emerging, having not eliminated, but sort of having possibly learned how to manage COVID, the you know, how to cope with Brexit. We're still in the foothills of doing that. What is happening to the world because of the current security situation? That's going to change the map of the world, I think, and people's attitudes very considerably. And of course, ahead of us, we've got the huge challenge of getting to net zero by 2050 um, uh, in the best possible shape. So we have much to do. Now, apart from the work that she does, Vivian serves on the board of the Confederation of British Industry the Mayor of London's Business Advisory Board, and the Harvard Board of Overseas, uh, Overseers. Um, Vivian is Chair of Teach First, which is an amazing charity focused on really on getting really talented young people into teaching when they graduate, getting the very, very best students to go into teaching. And I think that charity has done a sensational job in improving teaching standards in this country and also in changing people's attitudes towards teaching. Because many of the people who go in on the basis that they do it for a couple of years and then if they come out, they'll be guaranteed a good job somewhere else. Many of them stay and make a career from teaching. So, and finally, she's a trustee of the British Museum. In 2018, a well-deserved honor, she was appointed a Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire for all that she has done to the economy, for the economy and for women in business. Now, the only flaw I've been able to find in uh, Vivian's CV is I've discovered that she's an alumna of Harvard College, nothing wrong with that, <laughs> and received her MBA from Harvard Business School. The only way in which this CV could have been strengthened <laughs> would have been if she'd actually got her MBA from Imperial College. <laughs> but if you set aside that small blemish on her CV, <laughs> then she is an absolutely outstanding individual. I've known her for some time. I admire her hugely, and I think she'll be a great speaker for us tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to, I'd like to invite Vivian to take the stage and, and speak to us. This is the bit where I don't fall off the stage. <laughs> Um, Dot, it is a real pleasure to meet you. Um, I know you're not supposed to do introductions live from the stage, but it's just your generosity and warmth um, really just reminds me of my responsibility to do the best I can in Joan's memory. And John, it is uh, always a privilege to be with you, and I'm delighted that you, Mary, and so many of you are, are continuing to make Imperial the great uh, and leading global institution that it is. It's just, it's good to be back at Imperial, and it's a particular privilege to be with you on International Women's Day. That's the day that I received my damehood, uh, by the way, in 2018, so it always stands out in my mind for those two reasons. Um, education, which John mentioned, as well as women's empowerment, are two things that I feel strongly about. I always say that my path in life was um, 
really determined by a hardworking and humble uh, family and a good education. And anyone who had the access to the values framework that I was fortunate enough to be raised in, as well as the education that I was privileged to receive, even if a little bit of it was at Harvard. But most of it was in real life, with mentors and coaches and on the job and learning from failures. And if you had the, the benefit of a good value system and, uh, and clarity about who you are and a good education, you could go far in life. And that really is just you know, what I'm trying to do with my time um, and the range of organizations that we work with. You, too, have a long history uh, to both uh, learn from as well as be inspired by. Over a, since over a century, Imperial has committed itself to world-class education and uh, in some ways just making the world a better place through really strong, um, uh, particularly strong uh, background in science and engineering, but applying that in ways that are relevant to the world. Women's empowerment has perhaps not always been an explicit goal. And that is um, not to say that it's a recent priority. I think Joan's story illustrates that it's not. But we've been making a lot more progress recently than we had, let's say, in the last 20 years than we did in the 80 years before that. Um, Joan Woodward, who, for whom this um, a lecture is named and who Dot so eloquently and personally introduced, was only the second woman to receive a chair from this august institution. And I just can't believe that over the course of Imperial's distinguished history that there were not a few, or indeed many, more women who might have been great leaders. That's why bias matters, and breaking the bias matters. Because it's not just about giving women a fair shot to work and show their talents, but it's ensuring places like Imperial are the absolute best that they can be in all regards. And that requires a spirit and real delivery against diversity and inclusion. Now, that can be challenging. It's something that is very easy to say, but very hard to do. Because institutions are run by people. They're human beings. That means they're gonna be fallible and they're gonna make mistakes. What matters is learning from those mistakes. If you wanna build a systematic approach and real improvement at Imperial or any place else, you have to learn from the things that haven't gone well, same as the things that have gone well. Be patient, systematic, and figure out how to fix them. In short, it's another way to apply scientific rigor, method, and judgment. I didn't know Joan Woodward personally. When she died in 1971, I was a young child in the United States. But I greatly admire her range and her record, and I know her journey could not have been easy. Medieval philosophy, the lives of dock workers, quantitative studies across 30 plants in southeast Essex, laying the foundation for contingency theory. And for some, perhaps even at the time, they didn't see the connection between these things. And I confess it's not obvious from the outset, but it builds a pattern of work and an impact in business that really is, form in organizations, that really is formidable. According to one management historian, he describes Joan Woodward's work as about answering the question, why do some organizational structures appear to be associated with greater success than others? And that is why, no matter how distant or different I may seem from Joan Woodward in time and place, I feel a deep kinship with her. We are interested in industry, in business and the economy. We both studied sociology, which was my undergraduate degree, and we want to find real solutions that you can scale um, to similar questions. I've devoted more time, perhaps, to the specific experience of women in underrepresented groups in organizations and work, but we are not, from the outside, as different as we appear. She lived and died in a different time, only one year before the Equal Pay Act was passed in the UK, which for the very first time, 1970, said that women and men should be paid the same salary for the same work. Society was so different then, and it really didn't have a grip on the issues of imbalance and bias and difference in the workplace. 50 years on, how much progress have we made? I think we're still figuring it out, but with greater awareness, data, and sophistication. One thing that we know now is that having a critical mass of women in senior positions is not just good optics, but it's actually good business. Drawing on our research from more than 1,000 companies in 15 countries, including the UK, 
McKinsey found that companies that have significant female representation on executive teams do better in financial performance and value creation. This is a result that's been consistent since we first did our power of parity research in, 19, in 2014, give myself a little less credit, 2014, um, and has continued across many different lenses by country, by sector, by industry. Almost any way you cut the data, having more diversity, primarily gender diversity and underrepresented groups, is correlated with higher performance. So when it comes to breaking the bias, what should we be aiming for? Parity sounds attractive. Women are about half the population. Maybe we should achieve parity in life. But it's only one goal. And the choices that men and women make, particularly when it comes to work, might be different. And being fair may not mean always being equal. For example, women today account for about 57% of the university places in Britain. I would question policies that would seek to equalize that ratio with a blunt instrument, such as denying women places that they were qualified for. We have to apply both analysis but also judgment. But it is important to know the numbers, and it's always a good place to start. And whenever you see statistically significant disparity, that may not be necessarily evidence that there's bias, but it certainly can point you in a direction. I'm suspicious, for example, in North America that only 86 women are promoted for every 100 men across almost all industries. Or that women founders get less than 3% of venture capital, particularly at early rounds. So how can you say to a woman, go off and start a business, be an entrepreneur, when the numbers tell her I've only a 3% chance of getting funded? Here's another oddity that I find puzzling. Women account for about two-thirds of Britain's secondary school teachers. But when you get to deputy and head, that number is cut in half. Only about one-third are female. These numbers raise red flags. Perhaps that not everything everywhere is as it should be. And they could, in fact, be signs of systemic failure. And that's why it's important that relevant statistics are collected and analyzed in a thoughtful way. You will see many scientists and technicians in the room. So I'm sure you can appreciate the importance of good evidence as the basis for our decisions to analyze, find insight, and make corrective actions towards bias. It has to be troubling, 50 years on from Joan Woodward's many accomplishments, that we still see women as substantially underrepresented, particularly in the fastest growing parts of our economy, technology, entrepreneurial startups and scale-ups, and other senior positions of influence. Fewer than one in five IT professionals in Britain today is a woman, and that number really hasn't moved in the last 10 years. This and many other cases I could name think not about the raw numbers, but about momentum. How much improvement momentum are we really ready to commit to? It will require a broad-based and sustained effort starting with having the numbers and a real seat at the table. Filling our pipeline, hiring, attracting and hiring women, as John mentioned, is the right place to start. And today, only 35% of Britain's STEM students are women. We then have to ensure that the culture and hiring practices, once those women have started, do not subtly or otherwise discourage them. In this regard, Imperial has a pretty good story to tell. Women account for about 40% of undergraduates. But that's not parity, but it has improved 28 points in five years, which tells me that Imperial may not be perfect, but it sees the issue and is working hard to close the gap. Because what we want are more opportunities for women and men to create an environment of excellence. Breaking the bias has to be deliberate, a choice, a set of intentional choices. These start, of course, with individuals, your own self-awareness, treating others with fairness and mutual respect. We all want to think of ourselves as good people who don't apply systemic or unconscious bias. But it doesn't end with us having good intentions. People operate within a culture as, or an organizational structure or system, as Joan might have described it. 
And if the culture of an organization, be it in a country or an institution, academic, private or public sector, if the environment that you're working in is resistant to change, your individual actions will fall short. Consider in 1869, John Stuart Mill argued vigorously that women should have the vote. As one man, he was right. But culture and policy didn't catch up with him for another 50 years. So what should we do? First, and perhaps obviously, women have to be in the room where it happens. They have to be visibly and proportionally represented. But proportional representation alone is not a goal. You also have to solve for excellence and good outcomes. Theoretically, I could have a team that is entirely composed of black women with my same profile and background. But if that team is not inclusive and debating the right issues in an inclusive way, our results won't be good. Inclusion is a necessary part of systemic solutions, but typecasting, token representation, or just having a different mix of people for its own sake does not necessarily drive better results. It brings me to my second point. You have to be sure that there are opportunities for those women to develop and be promoted. Whether it be women or underrepresented groups, think about it as making sure that they're doing the toughest jobs in the company or the most interesting work. Some of the most complex and sophisticated work in society is where innovation happens. And by the way, it's often the higher paying jobs. Third, we need to be sure that we're in the executive suite where decisions are made with authority over budget and people development. In these instances, the point is to have people in a position to bring a diverse perspective to decision making, creativity, imagination, cognition, different experience. But we know more well-rounded debate leads to better decision outcomes. In the case of women, for example, our research has found is that female managers are significantly more likely than men to do things such as helping people manage their workloads, deal with work family challenges, build trust sooner and faster. Now, some of you may not have yet had much experience in the workplace, but trust me, having a manager who you trust and like makes a huge difference at work. Finally, this isn't guesswork or best intentions experimentation. It's not anecdote. We have to have a rigorous approach. This means, for example, deploying the analytic tools and AI and the data we now have at our fingertips to make better pay and promotion decisions, look at differential outcomes on groups, and embedding equity into our business cases. It's a deliberate choice, particularly as we're coming out of COVID, with such higher emphasis on environment, social, and high-quality governance outcomes. Our research has found that high-performing companies that are also more diverse and inclusive hold senior leaders accountable. They have goals and performance metrics, even financial incentives linked to tracking their progress. Companies that make building an inclusive environment a priority are better at it. It's like a virtuous circle. And the result may not be parity. It may not be 50-50. But there will be sustained improvement over time. Finally, coming back to Francisco's point at the opening, culture. Without that, even a C-suite or a board or a faculty full of women is not going to work. Inclusion is not simply a numbers game. It's about creating an attitude of mutual respect with the correct policies, minimal microaggressions, and a genuine openness to new ideas and constructive debate. These actions may not seem easy, or even daunting if you have some work to do. And I can assure you that no organization, not Imperial, not McKinsey, is perfect. But I think about it as a roadmap, a path that you can follow to take a more systemic approach to breaking the bias. Real achievement starts with high expectations. Whilst Britain has seen improvement and momentum, we still have a long way to go. And with that in mind, I wish your next president, Hugh Brady, the best of British luck. Or perhaps the luck of the Irish would be more appropriate. <laughs> As a scientist, he's worked in multiple projects across four countries and with many institutions. He will bring his own diverse perspective to Imperial. He will be one of many men at Imperial who have the shared opportunity and responsibility to champion and support women's success. 
that can only help you as you continue to make Imperial a world-class center of excellence and inclusion. I also have expectations, high expectations, of the women of Imperial. Faculty and students alike, you are going through doors that Joan Woodward opened. Be like her, believe in yourself, persevere, build your capabilities, even when it's hard, even when the odds are against you, even when you're facing the hyper-isolation of being the center of multiple vents, women in technology, women with higher degree, international profile, excellence in business, mother, daughter, carer, sister, friend. When you feel like an island, an isolated segment of one, remember Joan Woodward was there before you. You're not alone and you can do it. I know that it is when women and female operating models are really seen and valued, when all of you ladies stand tall as who you are, then we really will break the bias. Thank you. Dame, I'm going to sit you over here, okay. David, because we have the seats assigned to names. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and we practiced, and I still forgot. <laughs> I, I would like, very much like to sit in your seat in many years to come. So thank you so much. This was very inspirational. We're now going to move um, to the questions. Thank you for the audience and for the online community that has forwarded us some of these questions. But before we uh, open this section of tonight, I wanted to mention a few things. You're very right. We're not perfect. Every action you suggested to us tonight, we will take forward and we will try to take it forward. And I believe that although Imperial is certainly not perfect, we have the commitment. And we have the commitment to our students not only tonight or during your year, but it's a lifelong commitment. It's certainly Francisco's commitment, it's my commitment as your vice dean to be there for you in your journey as you transform, as you break the bias, as you help this, with this change. And um, to evidence that, we welcomed and we have a very privileged and delighted to have here with us one of our executive MBA alums who studied with us 10 years ago, who we've been following and um, celebrating her successes in those 10 years, Faith Ruto. Um, is now a coach, uh, someone who empowers women in her work, who has written books about a book <laughs> about how to achieve this change, and who has taken what she learned uh, in her program and before that to now help other students in their journey. So Faith will be taking on these questions and answers for tonight, and it's a privilege to have you with us today, Faith. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leila. Well, I think your speech was fantastic, and I was just going through the questions and you know, crossing them out because you are answering some of the questions that uh, we received already. Um, so in terms of um, the topics, um, most, most of the questions was on breaking the bias, uh, career success strategies. So we will get a bit personal with, with you and Leila and really know how you got here, some of the challenges that you have um, uh, endured. But also people want to know, you know, have a bit of optimism. You know, we're living in a time now where we think, it's all doom and gloom, but actually, as we can see, there has been progress that's been made. So I think that we have to remember to celebrate this day. Um, and yeah, so I've got some questions. Um, I'm gonna go with you first. Um, so um, how can you ensure that you and those around you uh, are not affected by your own potential biases? So this is really you yourself. How do you protect others? And I suppose we're, you, we're all a product of our experience, aren't we? Yeah. And so I, I think the thing to remember is that your experience or your, uh, your, sort of your journey or your narrative, as the young people say yeah. these days, is, is unique and it's singular. Mm -hmm. And it feels very, particularly when you're young, it feels very specific to you. But one of the things I've learned as I've gotten a little older and just had more experiences that you realize that there's a lot of people going through similar experiences. Yeah. And so what I tr would always recommend is that people are inquisitive, you know, sort of use the Socratic method in terms of questioning and understanding context and, you know, not make assumptions about environments and outcomes. One of the things that you learn is that what you experience is sometimes not that actually what's happening in a system. That's one of the great things about taking a data informed approach to these kinds of issues. Yeah. And I've had a lot of, you know, my own biases and challenges yeah. um, uh, 
I would say corrected, but challenged or expanded or nuanced. Um, and that's why great managers often ask you questions. Mm -hmm. They're coaches. They interact. You know, they're, they sort of ask, not tell. Yeah. And so um, as long as you're curious and open to changing your mind, I'm, I wouldn't worry that your own bias yeah. limits you from being able to be a coach and helpful to others. Excellent, excellent. Leila, do you have anything to add to that question? I'm just writing down everything she's saying. Excellent, <laughs> excellent, great, great. While we're still on the topic of bias, um, we know that uh, unconscious bias training and mm. such, you know, such like has been quite uh, a discussion uh, in the past. What is your view on how, what organizations can actually do to train individuals on, on their biases or how to break those biases? Well, I think there were probably times when looking at organizational structure and strategy wasn't even considered a business discipline, and that's why Dot's introduction of Joan was so powerful, whereas today it doesn't sound like anything radical because it's accepted as normal. Yeah. Similarly, I think that um, evidence-based and experience-based training around unconscious bias and multiple steps to build an inclusive culture is something that many organizations have done a good job with. Mm -hmm. You know, Imperial or McKinsey is not the first organizations to cross this path. And you would never try and, I don't know, launch a software improvement or a manufacturing line, you know, Genovo without learning from other examples. So I would learn from other organizations that do it well. That's one of the reasons why I am proud of the fact that McKinsey makes a lot of its research on this topic, yeah. just openly available, so that people can actually learn from good experiences and, and use it. But um, if we just take it at headline level, with you know debate about culture wars and are people being forced to learn things and so forth, we have to remember that the environment that most women have been developed in yeah. has been missing these things. So we're just sort of adding to the environment and balancing it. And good training and coaching about um, your own personal biases, mm. as well as uh, bias in your environment, I, I think is always helpful. You can disagree, yeah. Yeah. we can have a debate. Yeah. Um, there was a really good article last week but Michael Vaughn, the cricketer, yeah. um, it was very interesting to hear how he was talking about how diversity training had just impacted his assumptions and frame about um, him being a really good intention person, but just not aware of what other people's experiences were. Yeah. And I thought it was really powerful that someone who people really look up to was speaking so favorably, but he said the thing that was the most impactful for him so far had been his own self-awareness journey yeah. of, of just beginning to recognize his own context. So yeah. I think it's effective in many cases, and the evidence certainly says, when you yeah. scale it up, that it also works. Excellent, yeah, I think, excellent answer. Um, I think self-awareness is definitely key. Um, and from, from my own experience as a coach and having worked in a multinational, um, just sending people to go on a course and say, we've done the course, it's, it doesn't work because it's not, it doesn't stick, right? So, so it's important to have uh, a fully, you know, people be fully bought in as well. Great, excellent. So moving from that, um, we already acknowledge that there's been improvement, uh, but the question has come in, what are the three things that we can do to move the needle on gender parity in the next year? Um, I think we've mentioned already that there needs to be a, a framework, there needs to be a commitment, there needs to be financial investment into this. We have to, uh, we have to address it as well on all levels. Yeah. Um, there, there has to be, self-awareness is also focused on, it's not just a woman's mm. work. <laughs> it certainly is uh, even more important to have men allies. And that goes to the point around, are you aware of your own biases? Are you aware of that there is a bias? Because we had a few discussions this morning around, but why do we even have this day? Why, why do we even have this conversation? We have this conversation because it still happens. And many of us in this room are not even aware how bias has impacted our careers, how it has slowed down our careers. So I think these conversations need to happen. You have to be generous with yourself and with everybody else because we're all learning. And we can focus on one area of diversity, which we are tonight, and there are many other areas of diversity that we're just learning about. And for me, that's also listening, listening to what we're all having to say, how we all have to learn from each other um, with this generosity around, we won't get it perfect, but at least we have the right attitude. Um, so that's, that's a combination of things. And then, of course, as you rightly say, you need the support on, all, on the most senior levels that this is the change you want to achieve um, because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, just yeah. a few. Yeah, those, yeah. Yeah, so I think those are really good suggestions, and I also think that there are some um, really good practices in academia um, that are being applied and experimented with. So once you decide which um, aspects of the university you want to work on, you already mentioned um, faculty progression and hiring uh, one, the student body, 
but also the subject matter, right, the interdisciplinary approach. Um, and then one area that is uh, certainly uh, discussed very often in higher education is how you can use algorithms and softwares to support how the tutors and in-classroom um, experiences, you know, in, at uh, the private sector, you know, it's like bringing it into the day job, you know, so not having it be something that is um, uh, coaching and development that's self-directed, that's only related to, to outside your professional day job. It's related yeah. to how you manage, it's related to how you lead, it's related to how you do your work. And when you bring it into the day job, you know, the value creation engine for a company mm -hmm. to use commercial language, <laughs> then you actually know it's real, yeah. right? And yeah. so I actually am happy to see more systematic frameworks and investments because it actually means it's being taken seriously. But if you think about the core of what drives excellence at Imperial, you know, in the research and the teaching, and um, therefore the disciplines that the students pursue, um, bring it into the mainstream of that yeah. is the, 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 and there's some great softwares and things that actually help you with even um, the calling pattern within classrooms and, and coaching within departments so that it's not something that you're being evaluated on yeah. by some external, you know, check and balance, but it's rather a team of people in a department, you know, that the six or 10 of us are going to work on this. And then I think institutions have seen a lot more progress when teams take on those goals themselves. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. And I, I, I took on point what uh, Leila mentioned about men also being a part of this. And I want to acknowledge the men in the audience. Um, I've attended a lot of a women's event and normally you, you can hardly find men in the room. So the one that I've told, you know, shown up today, uh, well done, and thank you for your support. Um, we're gonna move on to another question. Um, we know that during the pandemic, uh, everyone you know, faced a lot of challenges, mm -hmm. but those women that were in work, that were mothers, yeah. you know, we know from reports, had burned out. Uh, I'm a mom of two myself, so mm -hmm. I can say homeschooling is not something I wanna go into. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't want that word again, ever. Um, but um, I just wondered, you know, um, Dame uh, Vivian, from your own experience, you know, how have you been able to balance work and family life? Well, the first thing I would say is that whoever your partner is, um, it is really important to be with someone who understands why your professional development is important to you and who sees and wants your success the same or more than you do. Yeah. Because in the days when you do feel like that micro segment of one or when you've had a real setback or you're on you know, Zoom call 23 hour out of 24 yeah. um, or just you, know, you see the plight and the struggle that some women are going through, remembering that the vast majority of women in the world are poor and mm -hmm. facing massively even greater challenges than we do at Imperial. Uh, or even in um, uh, sit situations of uh, domestic or uh, structural violence, war at the moment, uh, all over the world, you know, you, you can just get down, mm -hmm. you know. And so I think you need someone who lifts your spirit, but also understands why your impact at work is important. Mm -hmm. The second thing to remember is that most households are dual career. We sort of talk from this upper middle class mindset of, you know, if you have to work, and then, you know, how do you ever manage, et cetera. It's like 97% of women in the world work, <laughs> Their income is totally essential to yeah. the household, yeah. Yeah. and it is what the majority of women do. So it's just, um, I, I don't think that what we do is anything but a platform to praise and celebrate the hard work that women do all over the world. Yeah. And, and I, don't, I don't ever get down about it, because number one, I have a wonderful uh, partner and friend, uh, coach and supporter in my husband. Um, who I think wants my success more than I do and give, brings me the clarity and motivation I need some days, so personally I feel supported. Yeah. Um, but when I look out at the world, I don't think what we're doing is anything special. I just think we have to honor the women whose lives are much harder than ours and, uh, and show up and try and do our best. That's really insightful. Yeah, no, I Thank feel you. that very deeply. That's really, really wonderful. Do. Thank you. Um, and Leila, I know you also have a young family, so. <laughs> Two kids, <laughs> yeah. a cat, and a husband. Um, I very much agree with no, you. I'm not giving you my husband, but I will give you my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, first of all, I agree with what you were saying. I think um, having a partner that wants to go with you on the journey and uh, mm -hmm. who you can have a good conversation with, and that can be a husband, a wife, or whatever is your choice. Um, for me, it was a conversation around uh, very early on, I told my husband, I'm very ambitious. I, and for me, that was professional 
And he said, I'm very ambitious too. But for him, it was life, <laughs> <laughs> happiness. And that was very interesting because we had a conversation about what do we mean with ambitious. Mm. Um, and that has helped us with our career journey because um, he supports me. He's a stay-at-home dad. And I support him with the word, uh, finding a, trying to find a work-life balance. But I wouldn't spend so much time on, on my own conditions, more mm. on the, what we've seen in the last two years has been so dramatic mm. in many, many ways. Um, and we have seen, and I, I'm thinking of some of my female academics um, who were balancing so many balls in the air um, and having such a strong sense of commitment um, and showing up to the classroom and showing up to their families and having three kids or uh, all these carers because they have parents to take care of um, and all of these situations are really hard on many of you, I'm sure they have been. Mm -hmm. um, and so for that, it's just important that you have a network um, of colleagues, of friends, of people you can talk to, and you can also raise a red flag and say, I'm having too much, I need help, mm -hmm. before it comes to a situation where we cannot help you anymore. Um, and having a community where you can also just raise awareness of that because we provide, going back to the frameworks, we provide opportunities. You know, you can uh, extend your uh, studies, you can reappeal for next year, or you can extend your uh, promotion opportunities, but um, they were considering men and women potentially at the same situation when the situations at home are not the same most mm. of the times. Yeah. That, that said, I'm very glad that the jolt to um, uh, hybrid working, which I think is permanent yeah. from this yeah. period, um, is a good thing. Anything that scales that happens to men as well as women, you know, normally sticks. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we will never go through, <laughs> you know, you know once, it, once it happens to men, it's beneficial. Yeah. Um, but, but you do have to put that into your policies, though, yeah. so that yeah. you've got the support and mechanisms and so forth. So it's not just down to the individual person and the individual manager. But I think uh, more flexible working, hybrid working models, uh, hybrid technologies, um, you, you think about uh, technology enablement platforms in business, it's almost like a hybrid yep. enablement of work. I think that is a permanent and very good um, change in the mm. workforce. It is a tougher managerial challenge though, yeah. because when you are really managing how people work, and I mean thoughtfully managing it with care, yep. expertise, criteria, actual yeah. feedback. I mean, it's not great to think everyone's great at their job every day, but some people need coaching and feedback. Yeah. So if you're really doing the job, it actually takes a more sophisticated and experienced manager mm. to lead a team when you're covering a, all aspects of a person's um, professional impact and their potential. Uh, we developed, and, uh, and my, my uh, friend Mary played a big part in developing multiple paths to partnership within McKinsey. Right. We have nine different paths, or maybe even more, and there's all different ways that you can go fast, go slow, stand to the side, uh, get support, and so forth. But managing that more complex paths through the firm requires more thought. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you have to build it in as a capability, not always just leave it on the individual yeah. and the family to do it. So I, I wanna be um, optimistic, not just about the problems, yes. but when systems change, when you have those things built into the system, it's much more likely that more women and men will benefit. And very secretly, I think, most men are very happy to have more flexible schedules as yeah. well. Well, my, uh, hus my husband is very happy. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I think yeah, sometimes they wanted to send me back to work <laughs> over COVID, but if we get rid of the pandemic, then maybe we'll be okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep the flexible working and get rid of the pandemic. If yeah. I add to that, because when, we, when the business school decided to redesign all of our lecture theaters and offer multi-mode, which for the students in the room, they know they can take the studies either face-to-face -face or online, mm -hmm. yeah. we were thinking on, we have a crisis, mm -hmm. we, have a, we have to find a solution, what can mm -hmm. we do? Mm -hmm. um, um, but very recently, I've been talking to some students who have told me the, the peace I have from knowing that I have my two-year-old daughter sick at home and I, don't, I cannot go to my MBA, I need to stay at home, or I'm just really having a bad day and mental well-being right now is mm. so important, I just cannot go to class. Um, when these really valid reasons are taken into the conversation, mm -hmm. those are positive consequences of a decision we took that for the business school certainly is here to stay. Yeah. So for us, the future is multi-mode, is in this flexible environment yeah. that will facilitate a whole new kind of interaction. Mm. Excellent, thank you. So the other question I have also, still staying within uh, your personal career Sorry. strategy. There's a lot, there was a lot. This is a shortcut. Um, you know, what, you know, this is to you, Dame uh, Vivian. What are the three biggest lessons you've learned as a result of failure 
in your life or your career. So you can choose life or career. But we, we want failures because we know you're very successful. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Listen, resilient, I think, is, is you know, still standing is how I would describe it as opposed to successful. Yeah. Um, the first thing is that, you know, People who innovate, you know, you know you have to do controlled experiments and conscious invitation, but involves a lot of failure. Mm -hmm. So you can think of failure as I've done something wrong, or we ran an experiment and we need to run another one or a different one. So you've got to not define failure as something that is necessarily bad or um, only a function of something that you've done. Um, if you're not experimenting and innovating, if you're not trying new things, then you probably are safe and mm -hmm. things are going well, but you're not stretching yourself, you're not taking on the most complex task, you're not showing what you can do in a different area. So you have to be thoughtful about experimentation and risk, mm -hmm. but if you just keep doing things the way you're doing them and the way you know that they will go well, you're not gonna innovate. And I'm sure some of the things that are most innovative about um, uh, disciplines and how to apply them and application of technologies are about creating at the boundaries yeah. of, of things. So obviously you're new in your job, you need to learn, but I think without some experimentation and some failures, it probably means that you're not taking enough risk. Yeah. So one is it's not always a bad thing to, to fail, um, yeah. so which is a comfort to me since it happens all the time. <laughs> um, the, the, the second thing I would say is that, um, you know, sometimes uh, my husband describes it as you have to uh, touch the bottom of the pool mm. and go down before you can push back up. You know, you've got to experience the things, the disappointment, the loss, the resetting of your expectations, um, and, and then that might give you the strength to then launch yourself in a new and different way. And so, you know, none of us are resilient because we were born that way. We were born innocent, and naive, and hopefully secure. You know, the, the, one of the marks of a, of a secure child is that they've got a predictable, safe, secure environment. You don't want a lot of risk and volatility for mm -hmm. children if you can help it. Um, but for adults, it's a little different. You know, we build resiliency and we learn through those things. So I think sometimes the things that have been most challenging and the last two years have been phenomenally challenging uh, for all of us in professional as well as personal ways. Some of those experiences are, are some of the biggest lessons. Um, and then finally, and this is merely for a lot of women who, you know, if we have a success, we're very quick to use we, yeah. uh, our shared uh, uh, objective. We collectively are working on it. You know, not enough about me, she says, but more about what we're putting in place for the school, et cetera, et cetera. So when the success, the team's done it. But when it's failure, I've failed. Yeah. Maybe it's the team that failed, yeah. right? You know? <laughs> so if success can be shared, right? So think about it this way. If the principle is that success should always be shared, it has yeah. many mothers and fathers, then failure should also be shared mm -hmm. and probably has many mothers and fathers. And so if you just don't attribute everything back to yourself, yeah. you never would for a success, particularly women. You'd mm -hmm. never say, oh, that was me. I got that. You know, you'd always say, what else did my partner or my team or my colleagues or my other students mm. do, or no, no, you go first and get the award. It wasn't me, right? Yeah. Um, if we did that with failure, it would just, it would just, it would have much less of a sting. Yeah. So I think we just need to be a little bit less afraid of failure and a little bit um, more willing to share it with others as well and not just put all the responsibility on our own shoulders as, as, as women or as individuals. Yeah. Excellent. Do you have anything to add? Um, I just, I'm say, well, I'm, a, I'm an optimist by nature, so I'm very quickly into, okay, let's see the positive side into anything. If I just add one thing, is the failure can be, in our case, for example, on speed. You mm -hmm. might be doing the right things, so it's not a failure, but you're not doing them quickly enough. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we have to reflect on how can we, how can we move the needle quicker? Mm -hmm. And for me, so right now, this is my, my sense of, are we failing there? Do we have to do it quicker? That's my only mm -hmm. reflection on that. I, I do think when you think about your role and responsibility, though, you have to be more thoughtful about how you experiment yeah. because, you know, you're responsible for a broader community. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, the burden and higher bar sometimes we have for senior leaders mm -hmm. to look at the systematic bias and, and try and build inclusive environments. And we hold l leaders and managers accountable for that. That's why I think that's appropriate mm -hmm. because you are responsible for creating an environment in which people are supposed to learn, grow, develop work or whatever it is. So, so you, sometimes it can make you a little risk averse mm, yeah. or, um, or make you more worried about your failures. But I think, you know, if you do it in a thoughtful way, it's, it, you, you, we can take a lot more uh, <laughs> chances and a lot more risk, particularly around inclusive environment, because people are afraid yeah. that it's gonna somehow have someone feeling unfairly treated. Yeah. Um, and I remember a man once before uh, the COVID um, 
a period that we're in and the impact of hybrid working, he said, you know, why would I ever want to work part-time? Look at what happens to women's careers when they work part-time, right? They lose 4% in salary per annum. You know, it gets to say their career gets interrupted. They lose the good projects, et cetera. Why would I ever want to do that? Um, whereas now, we have a much better way of thinking about it. So I, I just think we have to be le a little bit less afraid that trying these things, even as leaders, is going to be a failure. And just um, that's why benchmarking and, and case studies are so important in learning, because it just gives you the confidence that you can try things. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. So another question, and I think I want to link this back to uh, what Dot shared with us about um, John's um, experience of imposter syndrome. Um, I think it's something that, uh, I think even men, but we don't talk about the men that have imposter syndrome. I think it's something we talked about it a lot, mm -hmm. women having it. Um, and this is just a question. You could share maybe your own experience or how you've seen it. But um, how do you overcome imposter syndrome? And this might be to someone that is experiencing it now. Um, mm -hmm. What would be your advice to them? How can they overcome it? I'd like to go first. I'm having you it right now. I'm like, yes. my God. <laughs> yes, yes. Why am I sitting here next to this lovely lady? <laughs> right, how do you do it? You just go through it. Um, mm. For me, it's just bite your, bite your lips and go through it. And, yeah. uh, you know, live through it. Understand that you're going to have this feeling sometimes, You particularly if it's a new job or if it's a new situation. Yeah. Um, it's very common. It happens to men as well. Um, and we just give it a name, but as uh, lovely Dad was telling us, it has happened uh, always. So for me, just go through it as much as you can with your support systems there so that they um, cheer you up, look you in the mirror and say, you're great, keep, go keep doing what you're doing, um, which has happened to me before, but like, people, you're doing it well, they hired you for that, just go yeah. ahead, mm -hmm. um, and it will disappear. Excellent, excellent. I do think you can use some tips and tricks, though, because I have to tell you, when you're in the bathroom and you're just like, ah, you know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> um, and when I was early in my career, I know it's, my husband will be uh, stunned again to hear this, but when I was early in my career, I used to get actual written feedback that I didn't oh. talk enough in meetings. <laughs> Right, John's like no longer a concern. But, um, but what I would do is I'd have these rules, you know, so then this literally was just using my voice, just speaking in the meeting, I was so nervous. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just had these rules, which was I had to speak in the first two thirds of the meeting. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna ask a short open-ended <laughs> question. And then I had another associate or another colleague who was my same tenure that if I hadn't spoken by a certain point, yeah. that they would either, you know, kick me kick or, <laughs> or ask me a question or something like that. But it literally was just getting used to feeling like I was allowed to contribute. Mm -hmm. Now it turns out some of these meetings were actually quite hierarchical and I probably shouldn't have been asking questions anyway. <laughs> but, um, but, I didn't know, I, but I didn't know the rules. But I had, yeah. you know, I would have a question written out, I'd have the time, yeah. and they were just things to settle my nerves. Oh, um, so sometimes there are little tips and tricks, but the most important thing was that someone else knew yeah. and we were doing it for each other because we were the two junior colleagues in the room. And so I think sometimes talking with people about why you feel like, okay, I've got this job, or I got this place at Imperial, or I have this chance, yeah. you know, what is it that I'm afraid of? What is it that it's stopping me? And find someone who's good at that. Mm -hmm. Most people like to help other people. Yeah. And so I just think some of those things, you know, when you're trying to put your hand up in class or propose a new topic or do something, it's normally a skill set. It's normally something you can learn. And, um, and if you, uh, you know, do the super, superwoman pose in the map mirror yeah. and, get, and, ask, and phone a friend, those are the two, normally the two things that I, I would do. Um, the second thing is that underneath imposter syndrome, you know, at a more profound level, beyond the experiences and skills which are new for men or women, but for women there is something more insidious that I don't belong here, I'm not included, or people might be using bias or even, you know, um, com competition to maybe undercut you. Um, and so I, what I would say is that, you know, I always would write down, um, so if I felt that I had a role on a team that wasn't, that I felt overwhelming, I would always write down the profile of the person who's always doing a similar job. And what I typically found is at least my experience same. was <laughs> the same, um, if not more extensive <laughs> than theirs. And so, um, I, I would just look at someone who I normally thought was good at it, yeah. and I would say, oh, well, he did this. He's done four projects. Well, I've done four, and so forth and so on. So I just tried to take the sting out of it mm. because the, 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 the insidious part about imposter syndrome is not you know, the funny stories you tell later in life. It's the real belief in your mind yeah. that maybe I'm not good enough, or maybe I can't do it, or maybe my place isn't at the top table. Mm. And that, to me, is that that's the thing that we really have to be cautious about. So mm. use lots of tips and tricks at the beginning to get yourself technically skilled, 
but the mindset thing, having a friend or a coach, someone who helps you just remind you that you belong in this room mm -hmm. and that you can, in your own way, with your own style, really you know, be excellent. That's the thing that I think is, is that's the insidious part of in, imposter syndrome. That's where, why, where, where it can be a problem for, for women and others un, under underrepresented groups. Excellent, excellent. So Shall we open up to the audience? Okay. Yes, I was gonna, I've got one, but I think, how are we doing for time? Where's my time, people? Looking at Katie at the end. How are we doing? Where's the card? We've got, we've got five minutes? Okay, so do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, there's a mic just in front of you, actually. So please. Uh, yes. um, good evening. Um, this evening is actually really special for me as alumnus. This is the first time I actually came back to an imperial event since the pandemic began. Mm. I mean, when I went to the dentist, I was sort of walked through the campus, but it's like ghost town. But just really quickly, um, a general response to Dot, who I think you taught me, and also <laughs> when I was an alumni advisory board, she came to talk to us about the, the vision, the branding, and so on. Um, just one. Mind upon on ethics. You mentioned Southeast and ethics again and again and again. There's a part in um, Southeast and ethics called the Crouch Valley, mm. which they may be in north of. But my, I, don't, I have never been to Crouch Valley, but there are some outstanding vineyards there. And they make, they produce some of the finest Pinot Noir grapes. They've gone into still wine making, which is very challenging for England because of our climate. And now some English Pinot Noir, expensive though, are catching up the Burgundies. Okay. So that's all I want to say. But a far more serious question for the panel, if I may, <laughs> being on International Women's Day. Um, this morning I had a fairly long Instagram direct message exchange with a friend, a woman, who is also an academic in, shall I just say, a big Russian city. Okay, it's quite sensitive. She's Russian. Mm -hmm. um, very cosmopolitan, very international, very open-minded. We were talking about the Ukrainian situation. So, to cut the long story short, without going to my new details, she ended the exchange with, I'm a woman on my own in Putin's Russia. I'm terrified. I'm really scared. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Yes, she is on her own in that institution because even her colleagues are pro-Putin. Her parents, much further away, are pro-Putin. Her cousins condemn her for attacking Putin privately. Mm -hmm. She's got relatives being bombarded by shelling in Kharkiv, as we speak. So she's now using virtual private network to access the Western social media and so on, rather than be cut off. Now, mm -hmm. my point here is, we're talking about fear and dealing with adversity. I'd say, well, at least you're not being bombed. Mm -hmm. You haven't got your water supply, Wi-Fi, electricity, heating all cut off. You say, you have no idea what living in Russia is really like. Now, she described as living even in a major city in Russia as living hell I'm not Russian. I've never lived and worked in Russia. I have visited Russia, actually, for two weeks. Um, I've got my own feelings. If, you've got, if you want to come talk to me later on, that's fine. But my point here, Dame Vivian and Pano, is mm. as a man, I simply cannot imagine myself or any fellow men would say, I'm a man on my own in Putin's Russia. I'm terrified. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Because everywhere I go now as a Russian, I'm hated. Mm -hmm. Never mind all the sanctions and all the passages being blocked. So that's the point. Yeah. It might be just semantics. I just cannot imagine myself saying, I'm a man alone in Putin's Russia. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. The point here is she says, I'm a woman on my own, blah, 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 which I already said. Yeah. So i just like to hear your views. Is this very important, men versus W-O men? So, mm. Thank you. Thank you. So in the interest of time, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of got a little bit lost in the questions. No, there, I, but think, I think uh, but, yeah. I'm happy to. to, to take you, them, yeah. you actually, you're very right, and you raised one point that Dane Vivian mentioned. That is, we are, we are, we have to be aware of um, of the privilege that we have right now. At least I want to personalize myself here, being in the UK with a safe space in yeah. a safe building with a safe city, and indeed, we have been in the last days and weeks talking 
quite actively around how we could support um, uh, not just our Ukrainian students and communities, but also the Russian students and communities that are uh, in very precisely the example you mentioned and are at the moment suffering um, social media comments and uh, bullying and harassment situations um, with something that they don't believe in. Um, so at least with the business school and the college have been actively reaching out to them to see how we can support. Um, the gender element there plays indeed a particular role. Um, so there are initiatives and actions that are, that are currently in place within the college and the business school to support both uh, um, students and staff and the community that are impacted certainly by, uh, by what's happening in Ukraine and also those that are in Russia and do not agree with what's happening. So I think that's a very valid point you raise and it reminds us again how privileged we are and how important it is that we can drive that change and be more empathetic with what's happening in other places. It also shows you the power of uh, networks and telecommunications because you know you could never have been connected, you know, without the benefit of the um, the technology and the cloud, etc. And certainly, digital natives and younger people are out solving real problems on those platforms. And so, I do think, in the same way that we've tried to be really present and a resource for our colleagues in uh, Ukraine as well as our uh, Russian office. You know, within academic communities, how do you think about helping the academics, the parliamentarians, thinking about reaching out to parliamentarians? Today, we received, you know, a really um, uh, troubling report from our sister organization, Teach for Ukraine. Um, John uh, mentioned at the beginning that I uh, chair Teach First, and we have a similar organization in 56 countries, although um, the U.S. was first and the U.K. is the second and, and um, one of the largest and most established, but we've got a big organization, but that organization has turned its mind to our fellow colleagues and teachers in Ukraine, and that's gonna include everything from uh, raising money to help um, our partner schools and uh, the displaced uh, staff, um, memorializing you know, one teacher who we've already lost in the fighting and one computer science engineer who works in our organization, uh, places in the Teach First community members' homes for displaced um, people after they've left uh, the Ukraine and or if they choose to leave Russia. And so what I would just say is within your lane, you know, being an, an elite institution of academics, you'll have networks. And I would just encourage Imperial, same as any organization, within their area of expertise and your abilities to um, be as empathetic and responsive as we can. The Ukraine, scale of the Ukrainian um, displacement is not, I mean, it's been um, unprecedented 10 days. Yeah. You know, we are, on a, we are literally going into unprecedented territory, certainly within our lifetimes, and we need to rise to that occasion. And it'll build an empathy and a relevance for other displaced people that is also needed deeply in the world and our ability to handle more diverse groups of displaced people. If we can handle, Europe can yeah. handle the Ukrainian crisis, just the influx of people I'm talking about now who are displaced from Ukraine and probably other places like Russia, if we can manage that with the right uh, systems, organization, empathy, care, financial management, we can certainly do much more for other populations that are in need. So this is a, um, a, a really, really important moment, um, particularly for Europe, but it's, it's really good that you raise it because that is um, much more equally, if not more important, than the, the issues of what happens in a, you know, a private sector institution or a, a privileged institution like Imperial. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we're going to be here after this session, so if there's questions that you have, we haven't answered, uh, please do approach us. But I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you to you, uh, Dem Vivian, for all the time and the quality answers you've given. And thank you, Leila, for your thank support. You. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Thanks. Just before we let you go. <laughs> I did want to add two quick things. The first one is actually Imperial is going to be launching a whole series of initiatives. You've already seen, I'm sure, many of them regarding the Ukrainian situation. But in particular, uh, the university is launching a hardship fund to help both staff and students who've been impacted by the tragedy that's unfolding. There's also a sanctuary scholarship fund for students and a, uh, a sanctuary fund for fellows as well. So you'll hear more in the, in the days and weeks to come. Um, I did want to just say a, a, another thank you to, to Faith and to Layla, and in particular to Dame Vivian. And, and like Layla, I was furiously scribbling notes uh, of the many words of wisdom that we heard tonight. And I'll just share very briefly a few that, that resonated for me. Bias matters. 
breaking the bias matters. As eminent sociologists, we have to ask the questions, why do some organizations do better than others? And how do we find real solutions? We're still figuring it out, but we know having a critical mass of senior women is not just good optics, it's good business. We know that we need broad-based solutions. We need momentum. We need women in the room with a seat at the table. We need to hold senior leaders accountable. We need to make DNI, diversity and inclusion, a real priority. We need a culture of inclusion. And for each of us, we need to persevere. Even when the odds are long, we need to per persevere even when we feel like an island. We need to remember that we are not alone. So thank you, Dame Vivian. There's a wonderful proverb I'm sure you've all heard, which goes something along the lines of, vision without action is merely a dream. Action without vision merely passes the time. But vision and action can change the world. And on behalf of Imperial College and the Business School, I'd like to say thank you to Dame Vivian for inspiring us with your vision and for challenging us to take action so that together at Imperial, we can help the make, make the world a little bit better. So thank you. And please do feel free to take advantage of the fact that we're actually in person, which is amazing. And our, our guests, I think, will be with us for a little bit longer if you have any other questions. So thank you for coming tonight. We have now the cocktail outside, I believe. Katie, outside. Um, final words, take the opportunity. And special thanks to Mary, who actually made this all happen. <laughs> thanks, Mary.